going to I'm going to talk a little bit like we usually do so uh, let's do it this way I think because I think this will uh, make it uh, work the best for everybody so I'm going to go to the modules here and, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you I'm going to walk through a couple of things um, some announcements and then I'm going to walk you through lab and then I'm going to stop the recording and then if you have any other questions that you know you have on your mind or whatever you can ask them then you can ask them during the recording too it doesn't really matter um, and then we'll do the lab and then when I go over the last part of the lab when I go over the uh, details of it I'll start the recording again I'll explain a few things stop the recording and then I'll put that together and that'll be the asynchronous version and then people will have the option of doing it that way um, or coming to class what's what's interesting is there's a lot of you here today which is very good and there was a lot of people in Wednesday um, in, in, in the Wednesday afternoon lab but where the people did not show up was Monday which is odd it's like a whole bunch of people didn't show up Monday like who the hell doesn't show up Monday but then you show up Wednesday that was like did you you know Thanksgiving's Thursday so the pay the day people blow it usually is Wednesdays when they bail out no one bails out Monday and then comes back but um, that's what happened so Monday there was like only just a few people um, in class but but personally I, I looked at uh, there was a lab I don't know if it was your class um, or another time but there was there was one week um, in fact it was Wednesday it was a Wednesday class where there was a holiday and we couldn't have lab on Wednesday because it was Veterans Day so I I had to offer it asynchronously to you although you could come to the Monday class because technically I I couldn't teach it on Wednesday they won't they won't let you do that anyway um, when we did it asynchronously and we did it a, another time on a Monday um, to me those quiz scores didn't seem as good I mean I, it could be anecdotal and I'm just sort of making it up but but I think the synchronous lab, at least, is is important in um, guiding you to the right sort of way of thinking and studying. And I, I don't know if people get that as well asynchronously. I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, if you can be here synchronously, I, I think that works best for you. And I'll explain a little bit why that is um, as we go, or at least while I think what, what I think about that. So the first thing I want to tell you about, I want to make a couple of announcements to make you sort of aware of where we're at, what's coming up. Um, I just sort of realized, which happens every semester, that uh, we're in week 14. And what that means is in a 16 week semester, next week is our last week of regular instruction. So we have this week. Next week, you'll come back. We have one lab left week 15 you'll take your quiz next week and you'll turn in your extra credit next week and I put a spot you'll see here it says extra credit turn in spot that's where you're turning your extra credit and if you click that on it explains to you um, kind of how I want you to turn in the extra credit because there's a way to there's a way for you to turn it in if you read the instructions that it makes it easier for me to grade and make sure I've got everything you've done so if you read that it's pretty self-explanatory so we've got those two things coming up and then also um, I put together the lecture and lab final study guide so that's up there now too because um, because that'll be on week 16 so next week's a regular week we have a quiz extra credits due you'll turn in your lab all the regular stuff but then the following week will be the final exams and there'll be two final exams one for lecture one for lab and those will be on week 16 so I, I put the study guide together for you now so that over the Thanksgiving break if you uh, want to start early on it you know the idea being like you know depending on your other things going on in your life you know maybe you have other classes or whatever you have a big project due or whatever but as we get down near the end 
you know, it's good to kind of have a, a plan for the last two weeks. So if you have something really big due on Monday, you may not be studying it all over the weekend for my class because you might be working on that project. Uh, but but if, if you do that, then you want to make sure, like, when are you going to study for the final? Um, you know, so it's up there for you to kind of think about. Now, um, I've said this in all the classes, but just so you know, uh, and I think I've said this to you guys before too, uh, but but I think the finals are worth 50 points each. It's in the syllabus, and, and I'm going to go based on what the syllabus says, and I think that's about right. I think it's about 50 points each. Um, but for me, for Bio 1 at least, on the final exam, um, I feel like by the time we've got to this point and we've had all those quizzes, um, I, I have a pretty good idea of what your grade should be. And the final should sort of go along and match that. So I tend to ask questions on the final similar to what you've seen already. Um, but I, I tend to ask more uh, of the easier kinds of questions, um, in my opinion. Now, the final is probably harder than any of the quizzes you took just because it, it's all of it at once. So you have to study for the whole semester's worth of stuff. But if you've been getting an A on most of your quizzes, um, then I, I, I expect and I suspect that with just a little bit of good review, you'll probably get an A on the final. You know, it's it's not, I'm not trying to take everybody out all of a sudden or, or do anything drastically different. Um, so, so my guess is you usually end up right about uh, where you were on your quizzes. Now, that being said also, you know, if you failed every quiz and you've never passed a quiz and your best quiz is a 10 out of 25 on all the quizzes, when you take the final, um, I, I, I expect you're going to be somewhere around there again. You know, those, the, the, the student who failed every single quiz doesn't suddenly get them all right. Um, you know, that, that kind of thing doesn't happen either. So um, those students usually aren't still in the class. Usually they've dropped usually before they're in that spot. But, but it's somewhere near kind of what your performance has been on the majority of your quizzes. If you, um, you know, quite often a student will uh, maybe start off weak, you know, not doing so well on a quiz, and then they kind of figure it out, they study different or whatever, and their quiz scores go way up, um, then sometimes that kind of student might need to go back to the beginning and spend more time on that because, you know, maybe they didn't learn you know, one part of the class more than another, you know, so maybe they're getting an A now, but there's one or two sections where they were not doing as well. They might want to spend more time on that, you know, and that's a little bit different for each person. But um, uh, to me, the final is not uh, meant to be um, all that hard. I'm not trying to prove you know, a, a point where, you know, none of you pass and you're all traumatized after that. You know, so it's going to be it's going to be in that same ballpark of the of like the quizzes you've seen uh, before. Uh, I do ask new questions, so I write new questions, so they're not the same ones that you've seen, uh, but they're similar. Um, many times I can I can overlap things. For example, I can ask questions about cell respiration and photosynthesis at the same time, um, whereas I couldn't really do that on the quiz because we did cell respiration and then photosynthesis. So we separated them. So I can ask kind of simple questions about cell respiration and photosynthesis at the same time. And, and so that alone is like a question you haven't seen um, because I can combine them. But, you know, again, if you study the study guide and you know that information, uh, you'll be in good shape. Also, what I'm going to do for you, um, and, and this is because a student brought this up and I think made a good point when I thought about it, and the student's doing very well and presented the idea very well. And I'm like, okay, that's a pretty good idea. But so what I'm going to do on the final, uh, unless I screw it up, which I hope I don't, um, but I, I'm going to do the final. Um, you're going to get one question at a time, but I'm not going to do the question locking. 
so it will allow you to go back and um, that may not seem like a big deal to you but as we talked about it um, it made a lot of sense and he made a good point which is you know the way the quizzes are now where the questions locked if you get to a question four and you don't know the answer you have to um, decide if you're gonna spend more time on it and try to get it right um, or just guess because the more time you spend on it because you can't go back you can't you kind of lose that so you can end up wasting time on a question you're not going to get right uh, whereas if there's one you don't know and you skip it and you go do the next six and they're easy for you then it buys you time to spend on that one you know you can go back and and so it, it, it I think it works to your advantage that way so on the final I'm going to not enable question locking it'll be one question at a time but you'll be able to go back and switch it or change it or you know whatever so okay um, don't forget your extra credits do okay and also the last thing I'll say about the extra credit uh, make sure that if you don't know already once again I made a video about the extra credit rules um, you might want to watch that again just to make sure and I'll tell you why because a lot of times what happens are right about now if we're in class someone will say well how much extra credit can you do again and and someone will go 20 points or 30 points and 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 so they'll give an answer that either applies to them or they're just guessing but but remember it's it's based on your lowest quizzes your two lowest quizzes so I only bring that up because sometimes people spread rumors about what the rules are and the rules are the same as they are the video. So when you ask each other, you might get the wrong answer and you getting the wrong answer from another student is still the wrong answer. So um, if you're unclear about how much extra credit you can do, make sure you go back and watch that video where I explain that because it's different for each person okay so somebody had a question was it was it you Darren did you have a question or no oh it it it's timed and um um, if it's 50 points for each one, there'll probably be a total of 50 questions for each one. So, um, probably a total of a hundred questions for both is my guess total. And it, and, and it'll be timed. It'll be timed, but, but probably what I'll do in this case, um, is all a lot the the amount of time that you get typically for the final exam so you're a, when you give a final exam on campus there's a two and a half hour period by which um, students can normally take a final exam and, and they're supposed to have that time to do it and some would even say you're supposed to write a final that takes about that long which is kind of hard to do because it depends on the person. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the final up for your final exam time and you can take both of them there and, and you can use the whole time if you want on the both of them, which will give you more time than what you're giving per question now. That's what I'm thinking. Uh, yeah, there'll be two separate ones and you can do the lecture the lab one first is usually how I've done it I think I'll do it that same way so it'll be you can um, yeah you can do whichever one you want first as long as you do both in that time frame yeah that's probably what I'll do it's a good question though okay um, and somebody else had a question I think maybe yeah okay
Um, I think I can do that. Yeah. Let me write that down. I remember someone bringing that up at one point. Okay. Yeah, that's that's probably a good idea. Um, there we go. Okay. Question unlocking. Okay, so I'll do that. I'll try to do that by tonight. Um, no problem. Anything else? No? Okay. All right, good. The, yeah, oh yes, go ahead. Um, well, well, if you go to my, if you go to the extra credit turn in spot, I give you an example where like if you went to coaching, just tell me how many times you think you went and Perla will send me that information also. So, so I'll have you just tell me what you think you did. And then, and then, and then I also get it from Perla directly. Actually, I think now the way they have it, I can log in and see um, in the STEM Center. But either way, I get it verified from either the STEM Center or Perla. Yeah. All right. Anything else? No. Okay, then. Um, cancel that. I don't think we need that. And... Uh, Let's see. Yep, I'm sharing that screen. Okay, so uh, we did that. We're all good there. We're doing lab 14 today, our second to last lab. And um, the first part is a little introduction to the nervous system. A quick disclaimer, though, uh, and you can read this, and, and this might be obvious to you, but you know, we always want to be safe on some of these things. Uh, when we see potential danger. Um, the labs we're doing today are, are designed for, once again, for education and that sort of thing. They're, they're not meant to be diagnostic. So for example, when we do an eye test today, um, as one of the things, or, or we do a hearing test, um, if, if your eyesight comes out great and your hearing comes out great, it doesn't mean everything's great. You know, like there's professionals that determine that. So if you have a vision problem, you think, or a hearing problem, you should always go seek professional medical um, advice, not just doing our bio one lab. So they're meant for education and not to diagnose any kind of particular problem um, that you have. So there's that. So what we're going to talk about today is your senses and how your nervous system works a little bit. And we're going to uh, mess around with that and see how we can get that to uh, do certain kinds of things. And most of the um, most of what we're talking about, we start with these very specialized cells called neurons. And what neurons do is they send nerve impulses from one part of a cell to another. And that's how that relays information from one place to another. There's a video here on how nerve impulses work. And I also get into it in lecture a little bit more about the membrane potential and all that sort of stuff. And we can generally divide up the nervous system into peripheral parts, which are things like in your arms or legs and your senses that are outside the brain and spinal cord. And then that information comes in and goes to the spinal cord and or brain and it's interpreted. And then there's some kind of output often that goes back out through the motor output to your arms or legs or whatever you're dealing with. And different parts of the body and, and different ends of these neurons have different kinds of receptors 
that react to different things. So we have, for example, thermal receptors that can respond to heat or cold, or they're sensitive to that. Mechanoreceptors that are sensitive to pressure changes, such as your, your hearing. Um, you have this uh, membrane and it vibrates and that vibration then can activate this mechanoreceptor and send these nerve impulses into your brain and give you the sensation that you're hearing or interpret the hearing from that way and photoreceptors and chemoreceptors and all these that we'll uh, go into. And the other thing we'll look at today is that some of these uh, receptors and their neurons, some of them are tonic and some of them are phasic. And the ones that are phasic, when you stimulate them, they'll send the impulse. But if that stimulus doesn't change and it stays constant, uh, after a certain amount of time, you'll see that some of these phasic receptors will stop sending these impulses and that sensation of touch or smell will be shut off by the neurons. And, and then there's others such as um, like your eyesight, which uh, are, are tonic receptors and they remain active all the time. As long as light is hitting them, they're constantly sending nerve impulses as long as they work properly, that light's hitting them. So they don't turn off, they don't shut off. So some of them are phasic and will shut down. Others are tonic and will continue to fire and we will play around with that. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna deal with your sense of touch. Um, and there, there's actually a variety of kinds of touch that are involved in the skin and elsewhere. And what we're gonna look at today primarily uh, are what are called fine touch receptors that are located in your skin. So one of the things you're gonna need to do um, is we're gonna do this exercise called two-point discrimination and you would think you know I had it earlier today it's the fourth time I've done this lab but uh, what's ideal to use is a paper clip and and I had a paper clip earlier and I and I used it and it worked out great and now I can't find it anyway you're gonna take a take a paper clip and you open it up. Um, you can use other things, but I find the paper clip to work really well. And you put the paper clip. You got two points to the paper clip, and they're really close together. And you take that paper clip and you touch the end of your finger. And what you should feel, as you might imagine, is you feel two points because you're you had your paper clip. You got two ends of the unfolded paper clip and you're touching the points, you feel two points because you're touching your skin in two spots. So you feel two points. And then you you get those closer together and, and touch your fingertip. But there'll be a point where even though you're touching it with two points, you start to feel one point. You you can't feel two points anymore, you feel one. That's called two-point discrimination. It's how how good your uh, skin is, for example, for you to distinguish between one point and two points. Okay, so you're gonna do that on your fingertips, and then you're gonna pick somewhere else, and it can be almost anywhere else on the body, um, other than the fingertip. So you can do your cheek, you can do your forearm, the back of your neck, but you do the same thing. You take those two points, touch the back of your neck or your forearm and and you'll find that um, there's a big difference your ability to sense two points there should be quite different than your fingertips and we'll talk about that in the end so you're gonna measure that distance how close you can get to where you only feel one point um, and that's your two-point discrimination do it on your fingertips and then back of your neck or forearm or somewhere different cheek okay uh, then what you're gonna do is, on part B of the same touch one is you're gonna do this uh, tact it's called tactile adaptation you're gonna take uh, your forearm you're gonna put a coin on it you know put a quarter on it or something like that and when you put the quarter on it you're gonna feel it because you put a quarter on your skin you'll feel it um, 
and then you measure the amount of time it takes to where you don't feel it anymore. So even though you'll have the quarter on your hand, you'll feel it, but there'll come a point where um, you kind of start losing the sensation of that quarter on your hand. It'll disappear, okay? And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna put two more coins on top of that one, and you should notice something different. And we'll talk about that. But that's what you do. So you put one coin on, wait till it sort of disappears, and then put two on top of that one and see what happens. Okay? That's part B. All right. The next is your sense of smell, your olfactory system. And um, what we're going to do here is you need something that has some strong s sort of scent, some some something that... Uh, um, has a strong smell to it. So you can use perfume, you can use garlic, um, you can use I anything that, you know, has a strong smell that you can smell. Honey, lemons, depends on your how good your sense of smell is. Anyway, you're, you're gonna plug one nostril up, like just push your finger over one nostril, and then breathe and smell whatever your um whatever your you know whatever your chemical of choice is your lemon or your bleach is a good one um you don't have to like stick your nose right up and inhale it so you can often just take the cap off and all you need to do is be able to smell it so you plug one nostril you smell it and you just sit there smelling it and and you'll notice once again that this is again a this is a aphasic receptor, the olfactory receptors. And so after a certain amount of time, you won't be able to smell that anymore. That smell will disappear. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna unplug your other nose, nostril, and see if that changes. Okay? There you go. And then um, uh, there's a little video here that explains uh, one of the sort of unique uh, unique symptoms they found of COVID-19, which you probably heard of before, which is a lot of patients lose their sense of smell. They call it an acute um, loss of smell. And um, this, this is significant and important because it's one of the um, sort of symptoms that uh, separates COVID-19 from, from other minor symptoms like, you know, when a person has a cold or the flu, it, the, the, the symptoms that you have with a cold or a flu or sinus infections is kind of very similar to COVID-19 in the early on stages. But, but this lack of smell, um, acute lack of smell, loss of smell is significant because that doesn't usually happen with the other ones. Um, by the way, I think I told you last week, I wasn't feeling well. And, and I was thinking about not going to get my COVID test because I had to wait so long anyway. Anyway, I woke up the next day, felt even worse. So I decided I'd go, went, got my test done, negative. So that's the end of the story. So now I know I don't have it. So now I'm trying to stay away from everybody else because cause I know I don't have it. You know, other people are like, I don't think I've got it, but I know I don't have it. You know, so now I'm going to wear a suit over my head and and save myself from everybody but anyway that's the loss of smell and you can watch that one and they explain why they think that is then we have one on your taste buds and your sense of taste and uh, so um, we used to do this thing called tongue mapping um, and it's thought that uh, we used to think that you had taste buds only in these certain areas but it turns out your taste buds are located all over your tongue uh, although they might be more concentrated in one spot on your tongue more than others. And this is where you're going to need your sugar, salt, vinegar, and baking soda. And you just need a little amount of it. You get uh, your you get your little um, your Q-tip thing and you dip it in there and you just touch those four parts of your tongue and you see if you can taste the sweet or bitter or sour taste 
on those parts of your tongue. Okay, pretty simple. Then uh, we get into the eyesight, uh, the photoreceptors. And um, so talk briefly here about um, our, our eye, the type of eye we have is often what we call a, a camera type eye. And by that, we mean there, there's a lens that focuses light onto the back of the retina and there are photoreceptive cells there that sense uh, an image. They build an image based on the stimulus of a whole bunch of different photoreceptive cells in the back. And there are generally there are sort of two categories of photoreceptive cells. There are what are called rods and rods are really useful for detecting um, light in general, light and dark. So an animal that has nothing but rods sees lights and darks and shades of that, but they see in black and white, essentially. Um, and then animals that have cones see in color. So humans, for example, have both rods and cones as photoreceptors, but we tend to have um, a relatively larger abundance of cones than a lot of other animals. And so our color vision tends to be very good. Okay. Uh, animals like dogs and cats, which also can see in color, tend to have a bigger ratio of rods. And so they see better in low levels of light, um, although they can still see in color. Um, so uh, the little video about your eye here and then there's this um, diagram of the eye and if you look at this list of parts down below here it describes the different parts or regions and the functions of those parts of the eye you want to make sure that uh, of any of the figures you study for the next quiz you want to study this eyeball figure here because I'm going to ask you parts uh, of the eye. I'm going to use that same image uh, that you see there and and I'm going to label like the lens um, or the cornea or the sclera which is the outside. So you only need to know these parts here where they are on this image. Um, this probably goes without saying but just in case um, since I'm here um, if it were me, the way I would study this kind of thing is I would print out the picture of the eye. I get rid of all the labels and then I would I would be drawing on it. I would label the parts like this is the cornea. This is the lens and I would write on it. Um, you could also do it digitally where you cover those up and you point to the parts. To me, um, that that lack of that tactile learning it doesn't work well for me so I, I like the actual writing part writing on it helps me learn but 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 what you want to do for sure or what you don't want to do for sure is once in a while I have a student that will they'll try to memorize these labels like instead of learning the eye and the parts of it they try to memorize the order that the labels are in and so if if I add my own labels, which I do, uh, it throws them off because they've memorized the labels. So uh, whatever you do, don't try to memorize the order of the labels you're in because that's an irrelevant fact. You should actually study the picture of the eye. And then there's a video about the evolution of the eye. And then there's some images here of how different animals, these animals here, how those animals see the same thing. So here you can see the human eye. Okay, this is what we would see here. And then that same image matches some of these. And what you're supposed to do here is you read the description and you try to match that to the eye based on the description, the image of what they would see. And at the end, we'll, we'll go over this. Okay. Um, okay. Um, down at the bottom here. Oh, I went too far. Okay. I got ahead of myself. Uh, let's, okay. Wait, did I? Where'd my, 
Yeah. Okay. Um, then there's um, some information about blind spots, uh, where your optic nerve comes into your eye. There's no photoreceptors where that connects. And so there's what's called a blind spot. There's a certain angle that comes off both your right and left eye where you don't sense any images that come in at that part. They're different in each eye. So having your two eyes together, it overlaps that and you don't see a big black hole there. But a lot of your vision in your peripheral vision over here is sort of invented by your brain. So you're, you can't really see details very well on the peripheral side outside of your main center of what you're looking at. And so that the, the detail on the outside there is sort of invented by your brain. Your brain interprets what should be there based on what it's gathering from the center and the peripheral sides of things. And so that blind spot is sort of covered up in part by your brain. And this activity will sort of uh, allow you to uh, uh, uncover where that's at by manipulating you looking at something. Okay, so that's the blind spot. Um, and then there's an eye chart here. You've seen these before where normally you print this out and you stand a certain distance away, usually 20 feet, and you cover up one eye and you try to read the smallest line that you can and and you do it for one eye and the other and that is your vision at 20 feet what somebody else could see at 20 feet if you wear glasses and you want to try it without the glasses you can um, it, it kind of it's kind of up to you it's your choice the only thing we tell you not to do is if you wear contacts um, don't take the contacts out just to do this lab if you're going to bed at night and you take your contacts out anyway and you want to try it then, you can do that. But every time you put your contacts in or out, you know, you run a certain risk of getting something in there anyway. And so we, we just don't have you do that just for the sake of doing it the extra time. So you can, if you wear contacts, just do it with your contacts in right now. Or like I said, if you if later on tonight you want to try it and you're used to taking your contacts out in at night, in and out, you can do it then. Uh, and this, this also goes with astigmatism, which is an irregular shaped cornea or lens. And people with uh, astigmatism, an astigmatism, uh, which is very, very common, um, probably a quarter of you will have an astigmatism or so. And, um, what what happens is certain visual patterns that um, generally are replicated and have a, a, a spacing apart. Those tend to get um, they they can they tend to get bent or they appear uh, sort of fused together, depending on your astigmatism. So you'll see those charts slightly differently, and there's videos on that. And then there's a section on color blindness different kinds of color blindness and what you might see if you have, um, if you're lacking um, the ability to detect certain colors and you can see some of them are common in men, uh, more common in men because they tend to be on the X chromosome. But there's uh, one of them here, um, this first one, the blue yellow color blindness that's, that's not on a sex chromosome, it tends to be um, common in both males and females, um, although it's kind of a rare one. And then a little bit about seeing in the dark, having more rods and this thing called a tapetum lucidum, which helps reflect light uh, back onto your cornea uh, in, in animals like cats and dogs. Uh, humans don't have this. So um, when you're driving at night and you see the glow of the eyes of a dog or cat, that's the reflection of that tapetum lucidum. Um, humans don't have that, um, so their eyes don't glow uh, if you were to see them on the street at night. But they, um, but but the advantage of that is it, it helps capture more light in low light situations, which why which is why cats and dogs, although they don't see in color, they see far better than we do in low levels of light. 
There's also a video on the eyeball dissection. Uh, normally in Bio 1, we do an eyeball dissection and some instructors make everybody do it. I tend to kind of do it as a, I do it as a demo. And then if somebody wants to do it, I let them do it. But, but, but quite often Bio 1 students are grossed out by an eyeball dissection in particular. And so um, instead of traumatizing everyone by making them see an eyeball, eyeball dissection, I tend to kind of make it more of an optional thing. Uh, also, um, so, so it's there if you want to watch it, if you want to see it, you know, if you want to check it out. Some people are interested in that. The other thing is um, I'm not going to quiz you on the eyeball dissection. You know, if you think about it, I'm, I'm going to use that figure because it's nice and consistent and, and it's easy to use. So I'm not going to use the eyeball dissection and point to things on a quiz. I'm going to use the actual picture. So it's there if you want to see it. Um, it's kind of neat if you're into that kind of thing, but um, not required for the quiz next time. And that part I will post in a minute um, and I'll talk about that. So this one, the next one here, we have two more. One's on hearing and balance. And uh, so what happens in hearing is that sound waves travel and they vibrate your tympanic membrane here. And then that changes pressure on the inside of your ear. And that is then interpreted as sound. So that's how we hear different sounds. So then there's a little video on the science of hearing. And I'm gonna say this very clearly so you understand, um, I see this chart here on the range of hearing of different animals. And I think it's really neat. It shows you a whole bunch of different animals in the wide range of hearing. Some of it's way beyond the hearing scope of humans. It's, it's an interesting graph. And normally when someone like me says all that stuff about something they find particularly interesting. It's usually a key that it's what would be on a quiz or exam. But I'm telling you, I'm not going to ask you this on the quiz or exam because although I like it and it's neat, it seems like it's quite a bit for you to have to memorize. So this would be, I think this is a little over the top. Okay. So I'm not going to ask you questions from the chart. You can look at it and you can enjoy it as much as I did. But if you ever have an instructor that spends an unusual amount of time on something, that's usually a key that they were going to put it on a test. You know, you should be aware of that. You should sense it. But in this case, I'm telling you, I'm not going to do it. Um, um, but it's still cool. Anyway, then there's a hearing test you can test here. Uh, you can try this out different uh, way, uh, different wavelengths of sound, um, different frequencies of sound uh, to see if you can um, hear um, your ability to hear different frequencies of sound and, and amplitudes. But once again, you know, if, if you're experiencing hearing loss or you think you do, um, this is not, you don't use this and go, hey, I guess I'm fine now. You should go always get tested and that sort of thing. Now, uh, what's probably unusual to you is that right next to your ear, in, in your ear, um, there's this curled up thing. It looks like a snail. And that coiled up structure has fluid in it. And, and by moving bones that move that fluid in there, that's how you interpret sound, okay? Um, but right next to it are these three tubes that are connected almost in the same spot as that hearing part of the structure there. And these tubes that, that of which you have three of, they're called semicircular canals they're used for sensing balance. So as these chambers, which are filled with fluid, as the fluid moves and generates pressure on different parts of the semi-circular canals, 
it changes your sense of your equilibrium. And so what happens is that's how we sense balance. And one of the ways we're going to test this is you pick a nice safe area. You know, I'm looking around my room here like I wouldn't do it in my room here. This, this is dangerous because you could fall here and hurt yourself. So you find a safe place. Probably if I were going to do it, I'd do it in my hall um, because it's kind of narrow and there's less room for me to fall and get hurt. Anyway, you stand on one foot for 30 seconds, which you should be able to do most likely. And then what you're going to do is you spin around five times pretty quick. And then you do the same thing. You stand on one foot and see if you can do it. Now, just as a precaution, you know, make sure nothing's around where you can fall and hit your head on the coffee table kind of thing, obviously. Um, also, if you start and you stand on one foot and you fall over anyway, like you're like, hey, let's try this out. You stand on one foot and fall over. Don't do the spinning around. Nobody's ever fallen on one foot and then benefited by spinning around five times. It just makes it worse. So if you can't stand on one foot for 30 seconds anyway, uh, don't go spinning around. It's not going to be, it's not going to get better. Um, okay. Then the last part is, yeah, you might have heard of it before, but you probably, you probably didn't make a lot of sense or you didn't understand it, but it's called proprioceptors. Proprioception. Proprioception is this sort of uh, sense of where one part of your body is relative to another. And probably the most familiar example that you would know about um, from hearing about or seeing it on TV is the DUI test where if they have somebody and they think they're intoxicated, they have you stand out, put your hands out and try to touch your nose, right? Um, Normally, when you are fully functioning and your brain's working optimally, you have this pretty good sense of knowing where one part of your body is to another. You can put your hand in one spot and with your eyes closed, you can reach out and touch the other fingers. No matter where you put your hand, um, you're pretty good at that because, again, you have these sensors in all your muscles pretty much or in many of them that allow you to sense kind of where one part of your body is in space relative to another. So one way to test that is um, you can get a pen and you can write the word proprioception or you can write anything doesn't really matter but you write a sentence down or you write a word down and then you close your eyes and try to write the word and what you'll find is you're probably still pretty good at it. Um, but not quite the same. So um, we'll talk about why that is. Uh, why can you still do that? Which is because of the proprioception. But then why can't you do it as well? And we'll talk about that because it involves something else. Okay. So uh, that is the last part of that. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, in a minute here, I'm going to put you in your breakout groups. And usually what happens is it seems like the other classes have taken about 45 minutes. So right now it's 840. So let's say 925, 930, somewhere around 925, 930. I will, um, did I do the math right? Yeah, 920. Um, I will bring you all back together again and then I'll cover certain things that should have happened there. I'll explain what you should have got. Um, and then we'll take questions from there. And that's what we'll do. So.
Okay, I think, yeah, everyone's come out of the breakout rooms. Okay, so um, if you if you finished, great. If you didn't finish, that's still okay. Uh, ideally, you got, you know, if you tried, you got 80 or 90% of it done um, or somewhere in there. Um, you can go back and do parts later if you didn't do it. Um, but I just want to make sure I cover a couple things so that um, so so that you know kind of what should have happened, um, which it usually works pretty well. But first, let's do the uh, the two point discrimination one. And I I finally found a paper clip there. So what I was saying was you get the end of your paper clip and you take those two pointed ends and you touch your fingertip and if you measure that they're, they're pretty close together when you do your fingertip you'll find that you can get it really close together like maybe just two millimeters somewhere in there you know somewhere around one and three millimeters and you can still feel, you know, two points pretty close. But on your cheek, you know, if you do it, I mean, I can be like that far apart. I could be five, six, seven millimeters apart, eight millimeters apart. So in your fingertip, you have very good two point discrimination. And elsewhere on your body, you don't. And that's because on places like your fingertip, um, you have a bunch of neurons and the what we call the receptive field is very narrow so there's there's a bunch of neurons but the amount of area they cover is very very tiny and so you have more neurons but they take up less receptive space and that allows you to sense more than one point better whereas on your cheek you'll have maybe just a few neurons, but they cover a wide area. So you can still feel something touch your cheek, but it's harder to distinguish two points because if you touch, say, on your cheek here and here, although those are two points on your skin, you're only stimulating one neuron. So you feel one point, hence two point discrimination. Okay. When you do the coin one in the tactile, um, um, stimulation you put the coins on and again they disappear uh, after the sensation of them disappear after you know a few minutes or so everyone's a little different on that if you put more coins on what happens you feel it again you feel it again right Okay, and, and that is because you've changed the stimulus. So the reason the stimulus, when you first put it on, it is there, you feel it because you, you created a new stimulus. But after time, if that stimulus doesn't change, your, your, th those neurons stop sending that nerve impulse. And so you, you stop feeling that. And it goes away. If you change it by adding more coins to it, you'll feel it again. It's kind of like the same thing happens when you put your clothes on in the morning. You feel your clothes, but you don't go around all day thinking about how you feel your clothes. You're like, you'd lose your mind. So things that sort of stay fairly consistent, though those neurons shut off after a period of time and you sort of ignore them. If they change, you'll sense it again. Okay. Um, this also applies then to the olfaction one, um, depending on what you were smelling and how good your sense of smell is. If you, if you cover up one nostril and breathe in, you know, like, let's say, you know, an onion smell or garlic or perfume, um, it will, the sensation of it will disappear after a certain amount of time. You know, it depends on what it is, how good your sense of smell is. If you open up the other nostril, you will suddenly smell it again because now you've changed 
the frequency of the, the number of receptors it's hitting. When you close one nostril, you're only hitting so many receptors in your nose. When you open the other side, you can generally smell more of it um, uh, pretty quickly again. Um, and that will disappear too, once again after time. Okay, then uh, taste buds, same thing. Um, you know, you, 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 you try the four kinds of basic taste buds out. The combination of those create different flavors um, that you interpret based on the combination of those four. Um, recently I discovered a fifth one, but the four, these four are the most common ones. And you'll find that you, you might have better ability to sense one flavor over another on certain parts of your tongue. But if you move it around, you you'll be able to taste it pretty much everywhere, kind of depending somewhat on luck uh, based on how you touch different parts of your tongue. OK, um, and then we talked about eyesight uh, once again, and um, I, I had this image up that shows you different uh, that has a human vision of this kind of plate kind of structure with the different colors on it and different depth. And then there's these different animals here. And then down here was a description of those. And what you're supposed to do is match the description to what you were seeing. And now what you'll find, I'm just going to skip ahead here for a second. But if you jump ahead here, I've added now this next page. So um, in your module, this page wasn't published before. So this is the answers now. So this is an extra sheet. And so if you want to if you want to check your answers against what you should have got, that sheet's now published there. So you, you don't have to look at it now. But if you go back and look at it, the answers are now there. OK. So I'll go back to this. Make sure I didn't miss anything. Once again, make sure that you look at these words down here. And that you know where these are on this picture, like I mentioned before. And uh, if they mention the function of them, for example, the retina and the fovea here, that little part in the back, um, that's your area of greatest visual acuity. When you look directly at something, you are making the light of the object hit your fovea and you have more photoreceptors there than you do really anywhere else in any small area on the eye. So you see best in that spot when light hits the fovea. Um, but just make sure you know those words there with that image and then you should be good. We already talked about that. You can watch the video about the blind spot and the visual acuity and same thing with the astigmatism. Uh, and then make sure you know the different kinds of color blindness here and uh, which ones are more common, which ones are affected by, um, you know, which ones are more common in males or females and in which one uh, they are. Um, there, there's no um, difference. In other words, it's on it's most likely on an autosome. It's on a chromosome one, two or three or one of those not on a sex chromosome, whereas most of them are on the X chromosome. And then you can look at the eyeball dissection if you want, like I said, but you don't need to. And that one I already told you about because it's already published there. And then uh, the, your your sense of sound. Once again, uh, you can take your hearing test, although I like this chart a lot. Again, I'm not going to ask it on the exam, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, you should, this is probably pretty obvious, but you should have noticed that uh, for most of you, when you stand on one foot, um, you, most of you will have pretty good balance um, and you can stand on one foot pretty reasonably well for 30 seconds. Uh, and when you spin around fast five times, um, you can't and you stand on one foot and you might have struggled with that a little bit, which is pretty normal, um, given that we kind of overrided, over, overcame your um, ability 
to counteract what your semicircular canals are sensing. Um, but I should also point out, um, some of you may be, um, I think this is true in the last class, but if you are, um, if, if you've been dancing, you know, your whole life, you've been taking a lot of dancing classes or gymnastics, uh, or martial arts, um, where you have practiced, you know, different kinds of spinning, ice skating, you know, where they can spin around, you know, 20 times in a row and jump in the air and land on one foot and skate away. Most of you would throw up probably doing that, but you can practice to develop a, a much better ability to handle that. Um, so, so some people, um, um, tolerate that better than others and, and then you can learn to get better balance you know by practice so if you stood on one foot and fell over or hit the wall or that kind of thing um, it doesn't have to be that way you could if you practice at it and some people pick it up quicker than others but but you can learn to handle the spinning and the ability to counteract that balance wise better than maybe what you did tonight um, if you chose to do so um, if you like again if you're into dancing or you've done that kind of thing your whole life you probably you know kind of already know that and then the proprioception what you should have noticed here is that although you can you can take your pen and you can write with your eyes closed proprioception assuming you can spell it um, you can write it reasonably well because as you write it you have a sense of when you make the letter P, you kind of know where your hand is relative to where it made the P in the first place. And so you can spell the word reasonably well, um, although it may not look very nice. It might look like you wrote it with your left hand or right hand if you're, you know, left-handed or whatever. But, um, but, but the more you write, uh, the worse it'll get. So um, as you write, one word and then maybe another or if you tried to skip a line or write another word you'd find that your ability to sense where your hand is is slowly getting worse so one of the big advantages of having your eyes open while you're writing is you can you can use your visual sensation to to adapt what it sees your hand doing and so you can get you can write better while you're looking at it because then you can use both your proprioception and your vision to um, enhance the movement of your hand. Whereas otherwise, if you close your eyes, you're just using proprioception, which is good, but it's usually not as good as using both. Okay. And uh, I think the last thing I want to say um, to mention, I think I forgot to mention this to you guys, but um, and um, if you, as I'm grading the labs and I'm getting through the labs, I've graded most of the labs at this point or many of them, I, I have found, um, and I might have said this already too, but I don't think I did because this has been like the fourth time I've said it. So it seems like I've said it even though I have said it four times at least and maybe five times. But anyway, many of you have turned in, let's say lab 11 um, and, and it turns out, by my fault I ended up with two places you could turn it in and you turned it in one spot or the other and so in grading it I might have given you two points for where you turned it in and then zero for a place you didn't turn it in and you don't need to turn it in in both spots but because other people turned it in there um, I'm trying to keep track of uh, uh, of grading it and making sure I give everyone the points when they turned it in. So once I grade them all, I'll go back and and I'll figure out where each person turned in, say their lab 11. And if you turned it in in one spot, but not the other, you'll still get your two points and you won't lose anything by the other column. I'll just condense them. I just haven't done that part yet. So if you turned in, say lab 11 or nine, and you see there's two places where it could be and you got two points for one and zero for the other, don't worry about the other one because I'm going to I'm going to be cleaning that up um, as we go into next week. But so that's where we're at now. It's getting better. It's just not quite totally there yet. So 
with that being said, uh, that's the last part I need to tell you about for Lab 14.